Everybody. Welcome back to the Fitter and Faster Coaches Corner. As always, I'm your host, Mike Murray. Joining me today is University of South Carolina Hall of Famer and sports dietitian and nutritionist. Did I get that right, Jennifer? You got it. Uh, Jennifer Brunelli is joining me today. We're so excited to have you, Jennifer. Coaches Corner has been a great resource for coaches since the start of the pandemic. You have so much to offer in terms of information for student athletes, coaches, parents, volunteers in our sport, a sport that obviously means a lot to you, a sport that uh, you have been involved with most of your life and at a very high level, uh, NCAA All-American while you were at South Carolina. Welcome to the program, Jennifer. Where are you and who are you working for right now? <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm swimming a little close to my heart, so I'm, I'm thankful and grateful to come back to the kind of train the trainer, if you will space for the people that really truly impacted my life tremendously. Um, I am currently based out of the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Uh, I have been a sports dietitian for goodness gracious, way too long. It'll age me um, for over 10 years <laughs> uh, and truly got into it because I went to South Carolina and had amazing coaches and I got better very quickly. And then it's kind of stabilized and I was very frustrated. So it was one of those things like, what can I do next? And it was that opportunity of, wow, like if I eat a little bit differently, I get more out of every practice. Um, and I can say this, a lot of my football, NFL, NASCAR, they'll share a little bit about later, but they don't understand us, right? Like we're a little bit cray cray. <laughs> so I say that because, I mean, I was a 152, 200 freestyler going into college and uh, shout out to my coaches because like Don Gibb back in the day, I mean, I went at 148 within one season in college and that's just not normal. Right. So I got stuck though, my sophomore year and thought to myself, goodness, I need to do something different or I'm going to go crazy because I should be getting fat. I, why wasn't I continuously dropping four seconds of the season, which we know is unrealistic, but whatever. <laughs> so I ended up changing my food and literally ended up going 145 unrested because we were short course meters that, you know, my, my senior year at NCAA is that fourth year. Um, but going into it, when 145 unrested going into that meet, it was like, all I did differently was food. So I'm oddly passionate about changing athletes diets. So started my practice here in the Charlotte area, um, have worked with helping NC state build out their program way back in the day. Um, was with the Panthers for seven, se seven seasons there with the NFL. Um, I've been with NASCAR for almost 10 years now um, with Hendrick Motorsports, with Rush Fenway Racing, with a lot of individual drivers. Um, I do a lot with Olympic athletes, but it's more on the private practice side. So a lot of swimmers, shout out to Swim Mac, and <laughs> a lot of baseball in this area. Um, and I, I think I'll share more about some of the other things as we get into it, but I do try to push women in sports a lot as well and where we can go within the future, um, past when you finish playing. Um, so I do a lot with Gatorade around an advisory board about how to keep girls in sports longer and get resources to women within sports to prolong careers. Um, so a lot of really random fun things that keeps my everyday never the same. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I love how you talk about uh, some women's leaderships positions in our sport and, and in sports in general, right? At Fitter and Faster, we have so many female clinicians who are doing such a wonderful job and using their experience with us to go and blossom in other fields. We at ASCA have the first female CEO of ASCA, Jennifer Lamont. She's changing the game. We're seeing so many athletes, Samantha Arsenal, Livingstone with her business being super successful. Your generation of athlete. Um, there are so many women in our sport who are doing really, really well. You have to be proud as a leader in the nutrition industry coming out of our sport that women in athletics is growing more and more. Yeah, it's really cool to watch. And it's, and it's different. I think, you know, I can speak to that female within the male environment on the NFL side. For six of my seven seasons within the NFL, I was the only female on the operations side where I was truly on the ground floor with players. 
And it, you know, you feel like, oh, it's, you know, 2015 when I started ish. And it's like, it should have been further along than it was. But at the same time, until you break that mold and show how successful a different kind of voice can be coming in, um, you know, it, they just don't know. People just don't know. Um, so you see a lot of that going on in a variety of different sports. It's really exciting. Well, and then also from the swimming side of things, to your point, goodness gracious, Samantha Arsenal, I mean, she, she, is, she is my generation. I'm like, I just love watching her on social media and all the impact she's having. And then you've got like, like right, Coach Kristen, who supports current athletes right now in their, in their strength within their own mindset, right? In their confidence. Um, you've got Carolyn, who was like, literally, <laughs> I was second to Carolyn my senior year a number of times. And I was just always so in awe of her. So when we got the opportunity to work together, you know, those kind of chances to coordinate as women and step in and show girls what can come next is just a privilege because we didn't have those opportunities and we didn't have those kind of mentors to look up to that did something other than coaching so that you had opportunities to go into different spaces within sports. Um, and you're seeing that more and more now. And it's really exciting because somebody has got to just get there so that somebody else behind us can say, wow, look at that. What else can I do to contribute? It's, it's super exciting. As a girl dad, I love it. I, you know, the more that the more we see of that, you know, the better example it is for our kids. And Jennifer, one of the things that I want to jump right into, I want to, you know, right out of the frying pan into the fire is we're talking so much about fitness and athlete health and wellness and nutrition and the role that nutrition plays in athlete health and wellness. And we have such a stigma around carbs in mm. this society and this cultural generation. Tell athletes, parents and coaches why it is so important for their athletes to have carbohydrates and not to be so afraid of them when these kids are working out you know, age groupers, five days a week, maybe advanced age groupers, set six, seven days a week, maybe 10 workouts a week for some national team members. Heck yeah. Yeah. I said, tell people all the time, we had it right all along with the pasta parties. <laughs> we had it right from the beginning. I say that because carbs are your primary fuel source for working muscles. They're also your primary fuel source for brain function, focus. So when we talk about this athlete, they're also a student athlete. So how am I supporting them and being well-rounded? Um, and I will joke with athletes all the time about like the head bob, right? Oh my gosh. I remember being in college and I was getting better, right? And I was like, but I was still in class afterwards doing the head bob. And I'm like, I should not feel like this. So, I mean, when we think about carbs being our primary fuel source, what a lot of athletes and parents want to understand is, can you overdo it? Yes. Like anything else. But this culture that has been developed around reduction of carbs to the point of none, right? The ketos or using intermittent fasting to create this restriction. And that's what it is. It's not doing the right thing to support the athlete. It's restriction. Um, they end up at a deficiency. They end up at a, dis, uh, how do I want to say this? They end up behind the eight ball, if you will, because yeah, you can store it in your muscle and your liver as something called glycogen that you can get to quickly. So my biggest thing with swimmers that I describe in particular that I describe, because we know this better than anybody, you jump in the water, the first 10 to 15 minutes, you're like, oh man, coach is going to be mad at me. I feel awful. I have no get up and go. But then 15 or 20 minutes in, you're like, okay, I don't feel great, but I don't think coach is going to want to kill me. That is a transition to a different fuel source. We are not like cars. We have more than one tank. So if you are deficient in that muscle and liver glycogen, the stored carbs on board in your muscle tissues that allow you to be explosive and move on to the next gear, if you don't have those, then you're just inefficient and you will keep going, right? I can't tell you how many multi-million dollar athletes that I've worked with that have said, hey, I'm here, I've gotten here. And I'm like, that's great, but how much better do you want to be? Because if you're not maximizing all of that time throughout all of those workouts, then you're missing something. You have opportunity to improve. So that feeling for swimmers of that first 15 to 20 minutes not being great, but then they feel better. You don't feel good. You feel better than bad. <laughs> That's not enough. 
So I share with athletes and with parents, carbs are your friend. Yes, it's not sit down on the bag of couch on the couch with the bag of Doritos, but for them to eat oatmeal and bowls of cereal in the morning, for them to use whole grain triscuits and wheat thins and things like that as part of snacks with, you know, cheese or Greek yogurt or combining it with protein sources and getting that regularly throughout the day is really important. They don't think about, athletes don't think about when the lows happen, a lower low equals a higher high. So we all in swimming in particular, because we're always starving, know what it feels like to hit that like, oh my gosh, I want to eat my arm off. And like, I'm eating while I'm cooking and then, or while somebody's making me something and I know it's coming in seven minutes and I cannot wait any longer. Mine are seven and nine and just started at Swim Mac, also do travel soccer. They come in once in a while and I'm like, why are you raging? <laughs> why are you starving to death? And we talk about what they've had all day long. And if they undercut themselves earlier in the day, they do want to crush it and they want to crush it for the right reason. They didn't get what they need. So now their body's asking. So I challenge people to really look at what's going on throughout the day instead of villainizing a food and looking at, yeah, a bag of Doritos is not the way to go, but oatmeal at breakfast, some wheat thins at, at a snack, two pieces of bread at lunch, um, Cheez-Its as a pre-workout snack, right? People look at me like I'm crazy sometimes when I'm buying out on Crustables for my NASCAR guys, but they're on the road 34 weeks out of the year and they're traveling. Like they need grab and go. How are we using these carbs needs to be the question before we talk about any kind of how much. Does that I make sense? It. That makes so much sense. And I think that sheds a lot of light on the way that parents, athletes, and coaches are looking at this without getting too molecular, right? Mm -hmm. Your body can't get to ATP, CP without having those stores. Yeah. So from a physiological standpoint, we need to have that food in us, right? Yep. Well, and let's be real. These, these trends and these statements, if you will, that come out through social media and all these random platforms now that we have access to that we didn't back in the day, which makes it harder for our athletes. It makes body image that's really in their face. It makes all this education that there's no background behind really difficult to weed through. So for example, I mean, keto was developed for epilepsy. So what on earth are we doing trying to use it for weight loss in an athlete, like, or weight loss for anybody for that matter? Um, you hear things that are tied to movement, like you burn more body fat as a fuel source at a lower heart rate. Well, that's fine, but you burn more calories in the same window of time at a higher heart rate. So how much, if you have six hours to go walk on a treadmill at 4.0, live it up, but I don't have that time. <laughs> so I say to people, it's like, okay, what's the goal and what, where, where's your life? What do you live within, right? I mean, you look at some of these pro athletes who train and pro swimmers who train for 90 minutes a day now. And if you look back at the way that we used to train like psychos <laughs> doing 10,000 yards twice a day, like what were we doing? We didn't know how to be efficient as the science has evolved and we've learned more about that for us not to keep up with it makes no sense, but it is difficult for parents and student athletes and anyone, even those that are educated, it is difficult to weed through all of the information that's out there. Um, so I challenge people when you hear something, find out where the information is coming from <laughs> and then ask somebody that that is their forte because it's amazing the wealth of information that is available to athletes at this point that is very straightforward. To your point, not molecular, right? What do I do now, today, to be better tomorrow? Um, so I challenge people to really dive into where their data is coming from. Jennifer, one of the things that I'm hearing you say is the importance, without really saying it, is the importance of self-awareness mm -hmm. and having the ability to ask yourself a question like, why am I so hungry, right? Instead of fixating on, I got to get this or I got to get that. Why mm -hmm. am I so hungry right now? Why is it important for athletes, especially to be cognizant of why they're feeling a certain way? One statement for you. Um, this is a big one. And I've used this for so very long because I think it crosses over into a variety of different spaces within training. Um, nutrition just being one of them. 
in a perfect world, you are going to be proactive rather than reactive. If you're being reactive, you've already missed something, right? And we have to be reactive in some of our learning processes over time. But for us to not then take that knowledge and create this proactive environment to stay ahead of any kind of problem, we're lessening our ability to be the best we can be every single day. And I, I say to athletes constantly, I'm like, if you are better today and you are better than tomorrow than you were today and the next day than you were the next day, you can't fail at the end. I remember coming to that realization as a junior in college, if my workouts get better and I'm stating the obvious, right? But sometimes the obvious is helpful. <laughs> if I'm better in practice every single day, I can't not be faster at the end of my season. It's literally not possible unless there's some mental components and mental wellness components to your performance, which we can help with those things too now, right? Like we have all those resources. So that's the challenge, right? Is can I be proactive in figuring out what my plan is for me based on my schedule for timing, based on my needs for my body and my output for quantity, based on my desire for quality? I have athletes that literally will cook every meal that they eat, every meal. They will not touch a prepackaged thing. That's fine. That was unreal to me as an athlete. If I look back on myself, that was totally unrealistic for me. That was not going to happen. So we can have all these dreams, right? Of the perfection. Stop, <laughs> stop with the perfection. What do you need to accomplish? And what's the most realistic way for you to do it and continue to maintain that? because it's that maintenance and it's that consistency that ends up breeding success. Absolutely. And I think Jennifer, you know, one of the things that we do as parents all the time is we try to jump in and solve problems, right? We want to <laughs> solve, especially dads and men, right? Like we want to solve the problem. We see an issue. We want to jump in. We're solvers. I think a lot of parents want to know and would probably ask you, okay, give me a meal plan for my child every day. You can give the broad strokes, but nutrition is different for everyone. Is that right? A hundred percent. When I, I mean, I've already seen three people this morning. I mean, it's one of those things where you can, we can give the big broad talks, right? That was something that really went on um, a lot more 10 years ago when I started. That has gotten less and less, to be perfectly honest, and it's turned more into coaching. And I, I do air quote quotes, right? Because I, you know, Coach Rivera with the Panthers used to say to players when they'd come in and I'd meet them, like, stop looking at her like she's got a magic wand. She's another coach. They would put coach on my chair because it's like, stop, I, I, I can't fix you. You have to fix you. I can give you the tools. You have to run with it. So it's the same thing for parents, right? We need to give them the tools and we can step in. You and I both know with the littles, they need more of our support. But I mean, a perfect, I'll give you a perfect example of that is like for my daughter's birthday party a couple of weeks ago, I was like, you know what, what I'm done with the jump zones and like, right, parent to parent, we're all like, we're done, we've had enough. I need something different. So literally we got to that place where it was like, okay, well, what can we do that we love? And Sloan loves to cook with me. So literally we broke out all of the pasta makers that we could find from friends and family members. And she had all her friends over and we did an around the world party and we ate foods from all over the world. And they sampled, if they didn't like them, that's fine. Try one bite, if you don't like it, throw it away, it's fine. But we made pasta from scratch by hand and they all got a chance to see what that was like. I think engaging, especially young athletes with their food is much more impactful than saying you need to do X, Y, and Z. So circle back, my back from your initial to your initial statement and question around, does it need to be individualized? And it's like, it does. We need to lay the base early on and give them the tools to do some of the things on their own, but the broad waking up at 6.30 and in the then your breakfast is going to be at different times. You don't store protein for later use. So if you don't eat it every three or four hours, you don't have it. Right. So 
if you don't eat every three or four hours and you're going these long windows of time with no snack and you have a later lunch in your school day, then you need to eat something in some break during school. And let me tell you, I have form letters that I send to schools for my student athletes that I work with that I plug and play their name, their sport, the dates we've worked together, because you can't treat a student athlete like a regular student. The expectation they're putting on themselves physically that's helping them in the classroom, we have to accommodate for that, right? So to your point, 100%, it needs to be much more individualized at some point, and it needs to be based on schedules. We build out schedules for athletes um, based on where they are within their season even. And a lot you'll see a lot of coaches and strength coaches do that and have done that for a very long time. That's still early on in our field where we look at off-season and in-season Swimmers, right? Our off season is a little bit of a joke. It's two, it's two weeks, but um, but looking at where the volume increases and decreases, right? Christmas training is rough. So your needs, even if you're like, sweet, I get to sleep all day between doubles, your output is still way, way up. Muscle damage is way, way up. So the whole point of working out is to build back up after you've purposefully broken down. If you're not doing that, then that Christmas training was not all that beneficial. Sure. So yeah, individualization, big thing, yes. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to talk to you about too, because it's kind of a, a buzzword, right? When we talk about nutrition is eating for recovery. And mm. there's so many, uh, so many information sources that parents and coaches go to, but talk to me about the first 15 minutes after practice. What are some helpful things that these athletes can pack or plan to eat as soon as they finish a workout? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And the first thing I would say is challenge yourself to look at recovery like it never ends. Because to your statement earlier, we train five, six times a week, potentially up to 10 practices-ish a week when you get to that higher level. Recovery doesn't stop. Yes, it is heightened post-workout. So we need to hone in on making sure athletes get what they need in that window because you've given yourself an opportunity to get that fuel in more efficiently and more quickly so that you can kind of slow down the damage that you just created on purpose and start that rebuilding phase. But it doesn't stop after that hour to four hour window. A lot of times people will be like, yeah, I got my protein shake. I'm ready to go. I'm like, wait, what happened next? Because if you don't continuously get that protein, like I mentioned, every three or four hours, you've halted that recovery. And we as swimmers know that feeling like putting your arm in a shirt and you're finagling yourself in because your shoulders and your back are so sore. That's normal. We can't take away soreness. That's an unrealistic expectation. Can we lessen the, in the intensity of the damage and shorten the, the amount of time it takes to get back to 100? Absolutely. So to your point, within 15 to 30, I would say within 30 minutes, those athletes need, depending on size, need to be looking for somewhere in that 20 to 30 grams worth of protein. It can be something like I grabbed a Greek yogurt. It can be something like a core power. We call them RTDs, ready to drink, where you crack it open and you drink one of those. It can be one of the horizon single serving milks. You know what I mean? It can be um, a, a turkey and cheese sandwich on Dave's killer bread because it's a higher protein bread. But what you're hearing me say is all of these things also have carbs with them. So we know if we actually cut into athlete muscle tissue and measure damage, if you put in just carb, just protein or carb and protein, the carb and protein mix is going to make that athlete muscle recovery happen more quickly every time every single time. So while protein is the thing that people go to when we think of the word recovery, we need to go back to that mentality of putting our foods together for a reason. So that's where, for example, if you're doing, a lot of athletes will use whey isolate post-workout, a powder, right? And they'll throw it in water. Like, that's great. I am super proud of you for that. Now let's take the next step. What are you going to have with it? And that's where, again, like, if, you, if it's a matter of leaving four hours before practice, you did two hours in the pool, 30 minute break, hour of dry land, and you need something quickly and you're not gonna be home in time, 
if you left your house with that core power shake and an uncrustable, then you have carbs and you have protein, right? So you have these things that are reasonable. You want to make your PB and J? Go for it. I'm game for that, right? But if that is an unrealistic expectation of yourself, then just get the uncrustable. You're going to be okay. <laughs> Something is better than nothing is what you're hearing me say. Um, and that, that 30 minute window and 60 minute window, an increase in muscle recovery for up to two to four hours post-training. It's true. It's true. It's not true for us that are like, I'm going to go to Orange Theory or I'm going to go to ISI or whatever training session you're going to, or I'm going to jump on my Peloton for an hour, five, four or five days a week. Like that doesn't exist for us. Unfortunately, that data has just been pumped out like it's universal, but the amount of damage that's going on for these young athletes is tremendous. So it definitely applies. I tell the athletes that I work with, look at recovery like it's threefold. One, it's within an hour. Second, it's within two hours of that hour. So if you want to have a post-recovery snack, that's fine. Have it within an hour. Within two hours of that snack, you need a post-recovery meal. But then I have some athletes that prefer the volume of food as a post-workout meal within 30 to 60 minutes. Fine. Two hours after that meal, you go ahead and have that post-workout snack. So that's one, there's, there's those two windows of time, but then it's the constant. Every three or four hours, are you eating to stabilize blood sugar or energy levels? And are you getting protein that you're not storing otherwise? Um, so it, to your point, it can be a variety of different things. You, I mean, you can stop somewhere at a Chipotle, or, you know, you can stop and make that happen. But the majority of times that is a grab and go. So it might be a little yogurt par parfait with Greek yogurt for protein, granola for carbs and some berries to bring down inflammation. Um, it might be a turkey and cheese sandwich with an orange on the side. It might be a ready to drink protein shake and a packet of peanut butter crackers, right? It's that combination of things that allows that recovery to start to happen at the highest rate. Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's such great information that coaches and parents and athletes can take back from this. Jennifer, one of the things that we see so much more now than even back when you and I swam is the variety of different diets that different families and people have. There are many more vegetarians, many more vegans. What's some advice that you give your clients who may be vegetarian or may be vegan to help keep their protein levels up and to eat diverse diets? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the pescatarian style diet, vegan, vegetarian based athletes, a lot of people utilizing this verbiage of plant based and where does that even fit um, there? You know, a lot of that that is shared through media. We have to discern where that helps an athlete and where it hurts them. Um, I can share that I like in the NFL, I had <laughs> a 360 pound guy who had been in the league for a really, really long time who came in saying to me, I am a vegetarian. He was, he wanted to meet me before he would join our team because I was the, the dietitian, right? And I'm like, man, this guy's taking this seriously. I love it. And he came in, I said, that's fine. We can do that. But let me tell you what's going to happen when it goes south, because it is going to go south. There is what's, what's pushed in the media eating more fruits, veg, beans, nuts and seeds, whole grains. Is it beneficial from a health perspective, from an inflammation perspective? Yes, 100%. So increase those. Eating animal protein does not hurt you. That data is not there. People love to act like it's there. That is not there. If you choose to though, more power to you. I support people's choices. So if that is something that they choose to do, I want people to go into these different diets if they're choosing to, eyes wide open. So that's why I shared with this 360 pound athlete, you can do that. But when we get to training camp and it's 107 degrees and 100% humidity, it's going to happen and this is what you're going to feel. So guess what? One night at one o'clock in the morning, I'm in the dorms where we sleep and I got the phone call of Miss Jennifer. What you described a couple of weeks ago, I have it. And I'm like, okay, time to put some of the animal protein back in. And we can do it from lean sources. You know, you don't have to eat cheeseburgers. You know what I mean? You don't have to eat fried chicken breasts. You know what I mean? But there is balance there. 
But I say to those that really are going more in that vegan vegetarian, um, plant-based does not mean vegan or vegetarian. It means more plants, yes to animal proteins. So um, I say to people, if you are full-blown vegan and vegetarian, when we put proteins together, you need to look for two. You need to put that there needs to be brown rice and beans. There needs to be peas with quinoa. There needs to be these combinations of things in order to get complete proteins. Um, and there's some generalizations out there, right? Like you absolutely have to take a B complex when you are a vegan or vegetarian. Not always, I mean, but if you're not paying attention to where your Bs are coming, B vitamins are coming from otherwise, yeah. Um, your iron sources, iron, veg, um, vegetarian iron sources are far less well absorbed than iron from animal protein sources. So it's like, okay, well, it's not, so that's what we're basically saying is you cannot blanket these conversations. They need to be looked at individually in terms of, okay, if you're a vegan or vegetarian, that's fine, let's do it. What are you using? Do you have enough variety? I have a lot of athletes and families with athletes that will go into it for sustainability reasons, for wanting to be more healthful and, I find those reasons personally very, very wonderful. We just are then challenged of, do you have the time to prep the foods that you would need to prep? Because if it ends up going to the vegan, vegetarian, black bean burgers that are already just as processed as what are more processed than the grilled chicken breast, how much did we really impact what your goal, underlying goal is? So yeah, there's all these different diets and it's kind of similar to the same conversation we had a little bit in the advice that where is this information coming from? Who is the data behind this diet based on? If it's you and me who maybe do our hour workout at, you know, five or six days a week and our normal training, right? Not, not like our crazy that we used to do. Um, can I eat in that style and absolutely get everything I need 100% sure some of our athletes it's an unrealistic expectation to put on them if it is a realistic expectation then it really truly is just making sure that there's enough variety that they're replenishing what they're taking out so what you heard me just say is too often it is what do I have to remove as opposed to what can I add I really like, I really despise that around my space, if you will, of like, that's bad for you. And that's bad for you. We joked before we got on this, Wendy spicy chicken sandwich is my, oh my gosh, it's so good. My kids know if we go on a trip, we're stopping at Wendy's, <laughs> but I don't stop at Wendy's on a weekly basis. So I challenge people to look at food that way. It should be enjoyed, but we go into it on a daily basis with purpose. Absolutely. One of the other things, Jennifer, I wanted to ask you about is another buzzword we hear or buzz phrase, I should say, that we hear right now is gluten free. And yeah. talk about, you know, how athletes that you've worked with approach that, um, you know, a, a, as an adult, I've, I've tried it and uh, I certainly feel better, but I still keep components of it so that my body remembers how to digest it. Um, but talk a little bit about gluten free diets for athletes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the great thing is those that need it, there are so many different opportunities for replacement at this stage in the game. Even a couple of years ago, it was not as easy to find gluten-free options to replace things that you had to remove. Um, I will share a lot of that comes from some of the food intolerance testing. So I want people to understand that that food intolerance testing is very much still in its infancy. And even the IgG4 testing that is as far along as it has come to this point, you can still have false positives, if you will. Um, you can be overexposed to the proteins within a food and it will show that you're creating inflammation, right? Um, inflammation, you're creating damage by eating that food, right? There are situations where that can be helpful. I tell people all the time and athletes all the time, I'm willing to use that data, but we are going to use it as a kickoff tool. It is not like black and white. If you were to remove something for a period of time, six to eight weeks, and you notice a significant difference, fine. What are we going to replace that with then? 
if you remove something and you feel nothing different and you're living off of that goal, that goal that came from that data, but there's no difference in the output of how you feel, that probably was not to your advantage. And I think like I've shared, like restriction is not my game. I don't, I can't stand that, especially for young athletes who are super impressionable and already overrun with more than they can consume and acknowledge what it actually means. Um, so as far as those kinds of things are concerned, I would challenge you to look at food intolerance testing like it's in a gray space, like it's a tool to use to kick off trying to make yourself feel better if you don't. As far as gluten-free is concerned, there is zero, let me be crystal, <laughs> there is zero performance benefit and there is zero weight loss benefit around gluten-free. The only benefit lies in if you have some kind of food intolerance and that is negatively impacting you. I am happy to be open and share. My son had a gluten intolerance for his entire life until just recently at the age of seven, he appears to have grown out of it where I could track his sleep and depending on how much he ate, his sleep quality went down as his gluten went up and behavior things as well. It was just crazy how obvious it was. So I would take it out for extended periods of time, six to eight weeks, and then put it in for two or three days. Woo! Holy changes in behavior, right? So I say that because there are like, those things should be fairly obvious if there was a need to remove it. But I do want to say ever, to everybody, loud and proud, like, do not feel like you need to go gluten-free if there's no reason for you to. Sometimes those with IBS and kind of some, some irritable bowel syndrome situations, that can be advantageous too. If you do higher level food intolerance testing and you see that, I would challenge you to try it, but try it, try removing it and replacing it with something else with eyes wide open. Um, not like, I absolutely have to do this and it's going to work. You should still be questioning, is it working, right? And this is everything in sports. It is assess, reassess, assess, reassess. That's constantly what needs to go because go on because you're evolving. Um, so if somebody wants to go gluten-free, there are options, right? And there are a lot of whole food options that are not prepackaged things that you can do. But please do not think that to your advantage from a performance or a weight management or any kind of situation there, because that data is out there. That, I shouldn't say that data. That data is not out there. That statement is out there and it has zero to do with what we're trying to accomplish with athletes unless there's a true problem. Last question, Jennifer, and, and this is another buzz topic in our, in our sport and swimming, and that's, uh, you know, taking vitamins, taking supplements um a lot of times you see these athletes taking this pre-workout mix talk about yeah. that and and maybe why it's so important to get our nutrition from what we eat and not what we're taking on the side heck yeah yeah i mean it's a food first ment it should be a food first mentality no question especially with age groupers, unless there's something clinical going on there is zero reason for them to be supplementing even with a multivitamin why people will often say it's a gap filler. And I think to myself, well, then why don't you just address the gaps? <laughs> because it's fine if you can't meet certain needs, right? If, um, if a child really does not enjoy dairy foods, okay, fine. Well, where is that calcium coming from? Where is the protein coming from? If that's the case, then yes, you need to replace. Um, however, we're in that situation where it shouldn't just be, let me just throw something at the wall and see if it sticks. <laughs> so food first with these young athletes, no question, especially because supplements are not regulated by the FDA like food. You and I could get together and if some big swimmer wants to slap their, their face and their name on it, GNC might pick it up. If they're going to make money, then they're going to pick it up. So that's the re unfortunate reality around supplements. So I will challenge all athletes and parents of athletes. The gold standard is, an, is a third-party testing company called NSF for Sport. There is an app you can download, and it literally tells you 
which ones are third party tested, which means this outside group that has no benefit from their sales comes in and assesses and keep actually keeps batches of every bottle, vial, jar that goes out. So if God forbid something did happen, you could go back and they can test that and you can show I did everything I could possibly do as an athlete to keep my edge, but do it in a fair sport, fair play way. Um, that is the way that we would approach supplements later with athletes who there is a space for it. 16 and up when they start potentially getting to your statement, 10 practices a week, significant volume, starting to touch some weights, potentially my pro athletes, there is a place for supplements. There are people in my field who say food first forever. And I'm like, well, then you've never known what it felt like to get to your 10th workout of a week, because there is absolutely things that you can't do. Perfect example. It would take six or seven beats every day to reach the volume of something within beats that help increase oxygen delivery to your working muscles. I don't know about you. I don't want one beat a day, much less six or seven. <laughs> 46 tart cherries give you this hugely anti-inflammatory benefit. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to sit around eating 46 tart cherries every day compared to a four to six ounce little juice. So that's why I say there's whole food based supplementation and there's baby steps, if you will, and how you introduce that to athletes. Um, but it should be food first. It should be filling the gaps with food before you jump to that. It should only be at the higher levels with the higher regular consistent output um, or clinical demands that we start to use that supplementation. And it should start with food first type supplementation. Down the road, there are things that are advantageous, that are safe, that are well, well researched. But I always tell people, you build your base first. You don't jump to, to, you know what I mean? Like you don't, you don't get to just go from group one on a team to group seven. So why would you do that with food? We, there's a stepwise process for a reason. Um, so I'm with you. I mean, so many of my athletes are drug tested and it's a really, really interesting space as college with NIL and some of these companies entering that space and what younger athletes are seeing their people that they're trying to model, what they're seeing them endorse, please tell your athletes, just because you see an NFL player, an Olympic athlete standing there holding this up does not mean that they are putting it in their body. <laughs> they're making money because that is now their job. So we could say shame on that athlete all day long, or we can let them reap the rewards of what they're going through and then educate on the other side, right? So I think that we need to make sure they know food first. We go, if we really feel like there's a need, I would, I would challenge people to find that support that can get you in the right direction as far as safety and as far as getting what will actually truly benefit you. There are supplements that can benefit athletes later in life. So find out what those are instead of, again, throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. Such great information, Jennifer, and I think we certainly need to do a, a part two to this and, and maybe uh, intermix some body image, especially with young athletes as they go through managing body image with with being a fit athlete and how do we how do we help guide them through that process is so critical. But really appreciate your time today. Now that your kids are swimming at Swim Mac, I don't know if you know this, but Chuck Bachelor is an unbelievable chef. And, I did not know that. And you're going to need to talk to him about, because he feeds the national team every once in a while. He'll, he'll do like a special dinner. So you got to connect with Chuck. And oh see my what goodness. Making next. When I'm over there and I see him and I'm working on my computer and I give a wave as he runs to keep doing his job, I'm going to have to pull him aside now and ask. And now you got to ask. Between him and Kevin Thornton, we are very lucky. We are very lucky to have a great system in place and I'm excited for my kids to get that benefit for sure, because goodness, this sport gives so much. So it's just fabulous. Jennifer Bernelli, thank you so much. This episode will be available Friday afternoon and uh, we will make sure that everybody has the information to join. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Look forward to talking with you again soon. Thanks again. Have a great one.